Deb. Uh, all those in favor of the agenda as printed, please raise your right hand. We have an agenda. It's okay, let's count. Um, the next, there are no comments from the chair um, this evening, uh, but the next item is the minutes from the August 20th meeting in attendance were myself, Kevin, Kate, Tom, and Rob, who are eligible to vote. Do I have a motion for the minutes or any addendums that people wish to make? Yes, Kate. Um, I would like to make a spelling correction on page two. Charlie Hahn is Hone, H-O-H-N instead of H-A-H-N, just to make sure we've identified him correctly. Other than that, they look very good. And I'll note that it was spelled, I think, correctly further up the page. Obviously, that's correct. Yeah, we so. missed one. All right. There were no, not two Mr. Hones that evening. No. Um, all right. So with that correction, do I have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Motion by Kevin. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Rob. All those in favor of the minutes that are eligible to vote, please raise your right hand. The minutes are approved with the addendum. That brings us to the first item on our agenda of business this evening, and that is One Granite Street. If the applicants for One Granite Street are here, please come forward. Could you state your name for the record, please? Uh, <coughs> Peter Merrill. So, Mr. Merrill, I'm going to actually put you under oath because we're going to take testimony. So, if you raise your right hand, the other right. Um, you solemnly swear or affirm that the evidence and testimony you're about to give under the ma for the matter under consideration shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury. I do. Very good. So, uh, let's start out. We're actually going to have uh, Meredith, our zoning administrator, give us a brief overview of what we're looking at tonight. And then, uh, Peter, I'll have you give some testimony in support of your application. Okay. Um, so this is a request for minor site plan and conditional use approval for one new art studio and the expansion of a current of a current art studio in the building, which um, is One Granite Street, the National Clothespin Factory Building. Um, and this the space right now is former manufacturing space. But that's what it's classed as. Um, and the big issue for the board is the authorizing the conditional use. That's why this co has come before you. Um, Art studio is not a listed use in the regulations. So you'll see in your packet that I have include, included a determination that art studio is closest to light manufacturing in this instance. Um, and then you go from that to the conditional use criteria, which are outlined on starting on the bottom of page 13 in the staff report. Um, so that's the big issue. Um, and then there's some questions about parking bicycle storage and landscaping, but the big one is the conditional use. So Peter, why don't you tell us about this? Excuse me? Why don't you tell us about this application? Um, well, I have two potential tenants that have seen a second floor, which was formerly manufacturing, um, and they're looking for an art studio. Um, it's about 900 feet, um, faces Granite Street with six windows that way and a couple windows facing southwest. Um, they just kind of like the ambience of the old building. Um, we're not trying to change anything. We're not changing windows. Um, it's got old hardwood flooring. It's typically what you see in a manufacturing building. Um, we've got to do some um, retrofits, um, insulation in the walls, which is non-existent. Um, and we may change a heating system for that area. Um, that's about it. Okay. And just to be clear, uh, this art studio, would this be any type of show or retail space? No, it's, it's, it's for two artists and they're not gonna have the public in, in any way. Um, where is the parking going to be for these spaces? Uh, Meredith, Meredith figured it out. Um. <laughs> well, how much existing parking is available that's not otherwise committed to either existing tenants or? 
Well, there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of combinations. We have shared parking. Um, some uses of the building are only there for, you know, 15 hours a week. Um, I rent spaces to the Hunger Mountain Co-op, which can go away when we really need parking for eight hours a day for a couple of people. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of choices. Um, Where in particular, though, I'm 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 just in. Maybe Meredith you can help you. Do you, you, you want a copy wanna... of the parking plan that you gave me? On yeah. Video. Um. Yeah. So one of the spots would probably be either um, number twelve or number thirteen. And the other one would probably be maybe 20 or number one. And those parking spaces aren't otherwise spoken for by uh, One tenants. of them is a rental for Hunger Mountain Co-op. Um, like I said, that, that can go away. Um, the other parking is, is more or less shared parking. The 1, 19, 18, 17, 16, that is shared parking for the movement center on the third floor. Um, like I said, during normal hours, you know, seven to five o'clock at night, um, they probably only there for 15 or 20 hours a week. Okay. I, I mean, my concern is I just want to make sure that we're not double counting parking spaces. Right. That, uh, you know, you're right. not, I know you rent to Claire Construction that you're not right. giving them spaces that you're not counting. Yeah, let me explain this. that. Actually, one of the potential um, artists is um, a member of the movement center, so she would be she would be using one of those spots when she is at the third floor. She's one of the teachers on the third floor. Right. Um, but I mean, the problem is is that we can't just look at who the specific tenant is going to be, because that tenant may fall through and have another artist friend of hers who's not part of the movement center. Right. Who right. Would need that that parking space. So you're identifying parking space one and parking space twelve as the likely. Right. And it, and it, and it, you know to satisfy you, we could get rid of two Hunger Mountain Co-op spots. How many spaces, Meredith, are we requiring again? Let me go back. So. Based on my calculations from the regulations as to how much is required based on the uses, the intensity of uses that I identified, um, they only are required to have nine off-street parking spaces. That's total um, for the total building? Total for the building, based on um, the two, two, two of the studios not having any customer traffic, the Clark Woodworking Shop and Third Floor Art Studio having minimal customer traffic, and the Movement Center having high visitor turnover. Mm -hmm. And then there's also a commercial office showroom um, with limited customer traffic. Because these aren't places where you've got people coming in and out nonstop like Allen Lumber. Right. Um, and so that works out to nine off-street parking spaces required. Now, the, the parking spaces 1 and then 16 through 20, we can't count those as off-street because they're actually in the public right-of-way. So that leaves them with, I think I... Did I say 13? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That leaves them with 13 off-street parking spaces. How they actually divvy them up, how they're actually divvied up is really right. kind of up to them. OK. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I'm, uh, I guess I'm less concerned about the idea of renting out these parking spaces if nobody's using them. But for purposes of zoning, making sure that we have these minimum numbers as required. Um, right. I mean, you obviously want to provide parking spaces to your tenants because that's how you retain your tenants right. if they need the parking spaces. But at the same time, I mean, we're not suggesting that you need to assign a parking space and not use it. Or it's just that for purposes of zoning, as long as a tenant right. needs it, right. they would have the, the right. Um, OK. Let's. Um,
And so you're anticipating these would just be these two artists coming, no commercial foot traffic, no, I mean, they would, it would be essentially almost more like an office that they would come yes. in, do their painting or artwork, and then depart. Right, no, no shows. Um, um, I mean, that's what they told me. <coughs> that was the question, really. Well, that's why I just, I want to understand, I think in part because one of the first questions we have to, besides the parking, we need to know the traffic. And so, based on your representation that this is not a retail or commercial space, that these are really, at most, two tenants, at, at most, two car trips per tenant right. per day, um, so that we can understand that vehicle flow. Uh, and I simply wanted to get you on the record to represent that as, as part right. of it. Right. The next issue I wanted to ask about, unless someone has another question about traffic or parking. Some horses don't need to be hit anymore. Um, bicycle access. What kind of bicycle access does this site have? Don't have a formal bicycle access. People have, they come on a bike on occasion. Um, we don't have a designated building for them. They've put them into an entryway that we have um, on not, not Stonecutter's Way side, um, or not Granite Street side, but opposite number 13, where number 13 is. There's a fire tower there that accesses the three floors. There's a space in there adjacent to the stairs where people have put bikes. I mean, we don't have anything formal, but people have brought bikes before. Um, so that would be inside. There's several places outside where railings, metal railings, or a bike could be connected to that, so it would be secure. Um, you know, we, that's what we have. We didn't have any zoning to tell us to put bike access in. Um, just people had bikes, they came and they used the space and... So do your tenants currently use, some of your tenants currently have bicycles? No, I mean, I'm, I'm just going back 10 years. You know, on occasion, you know, you'd see somebody with a bike and it would be tied up to a railing. Um, it wasn't in the way, it wasn't in a parking spot. Um, but you're also saying that you've permitted tenants to bring in bikes inside. It wasn't an issue. I mean, we weren't told to have a bike place no, like, and, like we are now. And to be clear, I, you know, part of this is the new, it's not required now. However, the reason I'm asking and, and maybe pushing a little bit is this is in close proximity to the bike path. Right. There is a massive bike path extension project going right. on. Right. And certainly one of the things that the city has tried to encourage is bicycle traffic and right. access and so I just I I mean I'm I'm satisfied that what your representation is people have used bikes there's places for people to park bikes there's no formal bike rack but there also hasn't been a lot of bike traffic either that's right um, <clears throat> so the next issue is um, is planting and this is a particular question could you give a description of what your site looks like, particularly uh, my impression driving by is that there's a great deal of paved area and there's not a lot of green or brown space. There's there's a few weeds that have sprung up between the paved space and the building. I don't know if, you know, if we're going to be counting those, but um, <laughs> Meredith noticed the other day, I think he talked about our, our one-story office building. You know, mm -hmm. that's adjacent to the river. Mm -hmm. You know, this is, there's a lawn out there. I mean, we've been mowing that lawn for 40 years. It's, it's about, it could be four or 500 square feet. It's like 10 by 60 or so. It's just there. Um, now, I don't know if that counts as green space. And there's vegetation on the bank down to the river. That's probably, there's a, probably a thousand feet down there. There's all kinds of trees, lilac bushes. Uh, going there. I know they're on the end of the building and you can't, it's not like having shrubs all the way around your building, but it's on the property. But at least, 
you know, if we look at your property from, and, and you're referring, when you say this green area, you're referring to this area between the office building and really the Winooski River. No, there's, there's, or is there's, there? there's about 10 feet toward the river before you start going down the bank. This, I didn't draw this picture here. I think I got this from the city. So they're, they're kind of showing the river closer, where in fact there's like a sandbar down on the river now, so we've gained another 25 feet out into the river. Um, but actually mold space right there, there's five or 600 feet that we mold that's flat before the river bank starts to go over the river. Sure, but... There's a picture of it here? Yeah, so, Peter. And there does appear to be there does appear to be trees on in in front of the property between the building and the Winooski River. You do have trees there's lilac, there. There's lilac bushes um, right on the edge where it starts heading down, which is a river bank. Yep. But you know there's an average of probably eight feet from the building before the river um, bank starts. Flat area, and it's like 70 feet long. So, so the picture that's the space right here. Yeah. These are yeah. lilac bushes right here that okay. are probably kind of overgrown into those the are, lawn a little bit. Yeah, those are massive. Yeah, those are massive lilacs. My goodness. Um, but this this green area here is that the is is that the only green area on your property, or are there other? I mean, apart from the weeds that are coming up between um, the. In part, we're we're just to give you a sense about where I'm coming from so you can understand, I think, and direct your answer is, you know, under the new zoning bylaws, we're required to look at the landscaping. And there are certain goals that are articulated in the, in the zoning bylaws to um, effectuate the landscaping um, plans for all properties. Um, and in part that, that deals with the planting. But I think if we make findings on this, it requires us to have an understanding about what, what we're screening or what we're seeking to screen or not screen or incapable of screening. Um, and so it's really important to understand, you know, what is the property look like? And so we have a good sense that between the Winooski River and your buildings, there's this line of sort of, call them volunteers, the, you know, wild growth trees, and they haven't been planted or necessarily maintained. Um, and then you have a strip of lawn. Right. Are there other green spaces? Um, between, I don't think it shows you, but Allen Lumber Company and I, and I just kind of share um, a, a space between Allen Lumber Company's building and the end of our office. We have our office right by the bridge, and it extends down to a garage on the other end. I mean, this is like 70 feet long. There's a space that's probably four foot wide by the length of the width of the building, which is 25 feet. Um, the water falls off Allen Lumber Company's roof into that area, and there's, well, there used to be poison ivy in there, but we got rid of that. But, I mean, it would, it would grow in there in that space, whatever you put in there. It'd have to be water tolerant, huh? It'd have to be water tolerant if their runoff comes off of there. I presume. Right. Whatever's in there is water tolerant, right? <laughs> right. Um, so, so that's that space here between the office building and Allen Lumber. If I'm, you know, if Granite Street's here, right? There's the space, and then, but I, I just want to make sure that I'm, I have the right understanding, which is that for the rest of the property around the factory right. building, in front of the office, between Allen Lumber and the parking area, and in front of the building itself on either street, we're really talking about pavement. Pavement, right. Um, and that's long-standing pavement. That's not something you just freshly created. Right. Um, okay. So I think that's helpful. Um, And is it, uh, what kind of landscaping are you proposing with this? Not any. I mean, Meredith, Meredith put it pretty bluntly, that, um, you know, are we gonna have to remove pavement? I mean, we're pretty much parked up against the building all the way around. Um, I don't foresee an easy solution to that. Um, you know, you've got a third of an acre of land there and a lot of it's building and parking and, you know, there's no, there's really no wiggle room. Any other questions? 
All right. Um, so the, I think it makes sense at this point, unless to go through some of the conditional use criteria and standards. In particular, Yeah, um, let's talk about the uh, capacity of the community facilities and utilities. Uh, this section requires us to make findings that the applicant shall demonstrate that the burden proposed, uh, that the demonstrate that the proposed development shall not cause a disproportionate or unreasonable burden on the city, city's ability to provide community facilities and utilities, including one, local schools, two, police, fire protection, ambulance service, three, street infrastructure and maintenance four park and recreation facilities, five water supply, sewage, disposal and stormwater systems and infrastructure. And I think um, in, unless the board feels strongly that the local schools, the police, fire protection, ambulance service, the street infrastructure and maintenance and the park and recreation facility are really not affected by this application. Um, I did want to confirm the water supply for this space. Is that city water and sewer? City water and sewer. Okay, and are you adding any capacity through this uh, change of use? Maybe one sink, a cleanup sink. Okay, into the existing infrastructure of the the right. building. Right. Um, so I'm I'm not seeing any other impacts unless anybody wants to explore that. Moving then on, um, the next issue that we have is traffic. The applicant has to demonstrate that the proposed development will not have an undue adverse impact or effect on traffic in the area, including the volume, type, and timing of traffic generated, that the traffic generated by the proposed development shall not unreasonably and disproportionately contribute to a reduced level of service to the affected streets, uh, and that reasonable me measures have been taken to minimize and mitigate the amount of vehicular traffic generated by proposed development. Um, I think. The evidence here shows it's a fairly de minimis, uh, if not a precisely de minimis, impact on this. Um, what is the space being used for currently? Are we talking about uh, one use for another, or is this empty space? No, um, this was formerly our um, clothespin assembly area and uh, the packaging of clothespins and the assembly of clothespins. The last 10 or 12 years, we've been making, um, we got into injection molding about 15 years ago because we had to have plastic clothespins. But more recently, we've been making medical parts for diagnostic equipment. Um, so that's injection molding. Um, we had three machines in there now. There's only one, and that one's going out of that space. So we're kind of winding down our injection molding operation. So. How many how many people are we talking about that would run these machines or working in this space that you're now shifting to a different? Probably space? one full time employee. Okay. So, so really, when we talk about this, and I just I think it's important to understand that when we're talking about the Im impact of traffic, not only is it de minimis, but really it's not two people; it's one person because you're replacing. You already have one person coming, and this person's going to essentially fill their space. Right. Um, okay. <clears throat> Unless there's any questions on traffic, um, I'll move on to 3303. That's the character of the neighborhood standards, and that requires the applicant shall demonstrate that the proposed development shall not have an undue adverse effect upon the character of the neighborhood. Um, so this is the industrial section of that riverfront, um, right. the granite. You're right next to the, the granite sheds and right next to Allen Lumber. and. Uh, nothing about this. In fact, I, you know, I understand that this is, we're classifying this as light manufacturing, but um, this in, in, in effect is probably going to be more closer to like an office type use because the right. testimony is that you have an artist coming in. I explained this to the artist about how they're being put in this box that says uh, light manufacturing. They didn't care what you called it. Well, I, I, I would think they'd be pleased about that, you know. Um, so the second criteria is architectural compatibility, 
new development shall be architecturally compatible with the neighborhood. This is not applicable because you're not talking about changing any of the out exterior uh, features. This is just different people in the same space. You might do, I think your testimony was there were some interior changes? Well, yeah, possible. Well, it's going to be um, new wiring and uh, the two walls of this space were insulated with what they used to call a beaver board. It was just a couple of spaces, a couple of uh, very thin layers of almost like cardboard to create two air spaces in the wall. We've taken all of that out and we're going to we're going to um, insulate it. The next uh, criteria is yards, lot coverage, and landscaping. This says that new development shall maintain a sense of open space that's appropriate to the neighborhood by balancing size and building's footprint with the mass and of the structure and size of the lot. Again, this is not applicable because it, you're not changing anything about the building. This is just a switch in the internal use. Uh, the final one is performance standards. Uh, and this allows the board to impose conditions deemed necessary to further the purpose of Chapter 330 including performance standards about noise, glare, odors, vibration, electrical or radio interference, waste storage needs, particulate matter, or airborne solids or flammable, toxic, or hazardous substances or waste. And I think those. <clears throat> so you, I read in your application, but I just want to make sure we, we're clear for the record, these are not, these artists use largely non-toxic materials. Right. Um, and how will waste be disposed of? I think most everything is water-based. But I mean, um, you know, if trash and such, do you have dumpsters on site? We do. Okay. So this would just go into the normal trash that's existing? Right. For the, right. Um, and then, I mean, we, there's nothing inherent as far as the art, creation of art that would necessarily trigger a noise or glare, or odor, vibration, electrical or radio interference. No. Um, they're not, they're not a particular type of artist that uses some large electronic device or HVAC system inside. No, they've, they've been asked already. And okay. uh, all right. Is there anything else anybody wishes to ask? So I just want to clarify. So they're, they're uh, essentially painters. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Like painting on canvas? That, that's what yes, it is? Yes, large, large canvas. Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions? If not, I'll entertain either a motion or discussion. I think we have to make a discussion before a motion about the landscaping issue. Um, what's the pleasure of the board? Let me just suggest that I, I, I think this is a similar type of situation to uh, the 27 School Street, which is that we've received testimony that any requirement that was based strictly on the perimeter of the building would be inconsistent with the lot and certainly the current conditions. Um, I'm just one board member and I'm just going to, you know, I'll let anyone else express, but it doesn't seem like this use triggers the need for any type of landscaping change, nor does there seem to be a need for that type of shift in landscaping, um, given that it's an industrial site and has limited capacity on its best day. And I would agree with that, Mr. Chair. Uh, and I mean, we have to keep in mind that this is, <clears throat> this is in effect, a reduction in the intensity of use. Mm -hmm. And we want to, I don't think, uh, unduly uh, uh, burden the applicant with improvements that would way outstrip the, the scale of the project you're proposing. willing to look favorably down the line of conditions to this application. Um. Mr. Chair, with a, with a net increase of one occupant, um, I, I don't necessarily agree that it is a de-intensification of the use, though I agree that it's um, as far as traffic and things like that, well, though it's painters well, instead of machines. From what, from what is allowed? I mean, clearly it was used as a... As from what is allowed, right. I thought you meant from what is currently taking place there. Which is, which is also allowed. Um, I would, given the need to balance the reasonableness of landscaping requests with the clear purpose of the landscaping and screening provision, I would value and appreciate discussing this in deliberative session as we did with the previous example last week. Um, 
I am also just one board member, but that is that would be helpful to me. Um, and I guess I would agree on uh, thinking about deliberative session for this, in part because um, the, these new landscaping provisions are tricky mm -hmm. as they apply to these uh, pre-existing uses. And uh, I agree with your statement that that um, you know we need to be reasonable and take into account uh, the particular lot. But but as a board, we're also creating precedent. So I think it makes sense for us to talk about how we want to talk about this because other applicants will, um, you know, will come forward and we want to make sure that we're consistent. Is that a consensus of the board? So I'll enter. Well, let me ask, is there any more information that we require from the applicant at this time or do we feel comfortable? Does the board, each board member feel comfortable voting on both the minor site plan and conditional use review? Yes. Okay. So. What I would uh, accept is a, a motion to close the evidence and move into a deliberative session. So moved. And the actual reason why we're moving into deliberative session is? Uh, to discuss, I think, the landscaping requirements um, and ultimately the, the approval of the application. Because I don't think we can make a motion to approve the application until um, we've resolved that landscaping issue. So we would close the record, move into deliberative session, presumably discuss the landscaping, and uh, out of that then approve or disapprove the minor site plan and conditional use review. Is that consistent with everyone's? I just, for the record, I will, I will vote to go into deliberative session, but I, as one board member, I, I don't see the need to do something. Okay. Duly noted. So there's a motion to go into deliberative session and close the evidence uh, by Deb. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Second by Rob. All those in any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of going into deliberative session and closing the record, please raise your right hand. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, we should issue a decision shortly. Um, we're just going to discuss this, and Meredith will be in touch. Let me leave. Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. As a matter of procedure, we typically do deliberative session at the very end for all. For any and all, um, can we do it in the middle. We can do it in the middle. We 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 have too, though, is it? No, we can take it up at the end if we wish okay. to. Um, certainly, given the scope of the next project, it would make sense to keep that moving forward if the next project is here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the theme of the evening. evening. I, I guess with the school, I was expecting a, you know, large crowd of children to. Uh, <laughs> So if you'll state your names for the record, and then I'll swear you in before you give testimony. Okay. 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 Okay.
Paul Beauvert, Engineering Ventures. Andrew LaRosa, Director of Facilities for the Montpelier Roxbury School District. Great. If you raise your right hand, you solemnly swear or affirm that the evidence and testimony you're about to give for the matter under consideration shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury. Great. Um, why don't we have, uh, Meredith, why don't you give a just overview and focus us on what we're doing because this is a minor, notwithstanding the very uh, voluminous application <laughs> materials, this is a minor site plan review and we, our scope is somewhat limited. So it's a minor site plan review and request for a waiver of the footprint maximum. Um, it's extensive revisions to the Union Elementary School playground, including some renovations to the entrance on the playground side for ADA accessibility, and that's where the footprint waiver comes in. Um, the major issues, um, you've got the footprint waiver, and then the other really big one is the development on steep slopes. So other than the footprint waiver, the only reason this is coming to DRB is because of the steep slopes, because we can't kind of planning approve that. Um, so those are your two big issues. There's also some minor things noted in the staff report in red about height of some of the accessory structures that we didn't have confirmation of, um, some issues with dumpster location, bicycle storage, um, landscaping maintenance, and an issue with the sign wall. Um, but really the big issues are steep slopes and footprint waiver. So, Paul or Andrew, I don't know which one of you want to take the lead on giving us a presentation. Sure. Let me to talk about what we're doing or uh, do you want to talk about the intent? Well, why don't I talk you through the overall project okay. and I'll highlight the, the issues as we run across them and, and then we can go circle back to the more specific. Uh, so the Union Elementary School project, which has been in the works for some years, um, consists, I would say first and foremost, uh, a lot of it is to do with stormwater uh, and stormwater control, uh, which Paul will, will address later. Basically, we're re rehabilitating the, uh, the upper playground, what we refer to as the upper, upper playground, providing handicap accessibility up to that playground and the play structures. And then in the lower courtyard, the inner, we refer to it as the lower or inner courtyard, uh, dealing with some stormwater issues as well as getting appropriate uh, play equipment for that age group. That's pre-K and first that we'll be using in that area primarily. So we're, we're getting appropriately sized uh, play equipment there. We're also doing bank stabilization along the back retaining wall. And again, stormwater treatment areas. The vestibule will be is about five, 600 square foot handicap accessible vestibule, which will be on the uh, northeast corner uh, at one of the existing entrances to the building. Uh, with regards to the slope issues, questions, uh, we have the existing slope in this area, which is below the 30 degree, uh, that we're basically just sliding this direction. Uh, it's the same slope that's already there, but we're widening it. Currently, the, the uh, fire lane is, runs here. We're now bringing the fire lane closer to the building, so we have to shift that bank over there. We're reducing slope over in this area. One of the areas of concern was over here where we're actually adjusting the slope. If anyone knows Union, it's a pretty steep bank over there. Near this area where it is becoming, I'll let Paul speak to the severity of the slope change, uh, there's actually stormwater treatment that is actually taking place in that area. The other question was uh, yeah, footprint, some of the slope concerns with slope. We also, I think in the packet, we had a diagram that had all these different areas of concern. In this area where we are affecting the slope, it is for maintenance and improvement of the retaining wall. So it's, it's, sort of, it's this primarily this area and then this change here. Okay. So we'll talk. Go ahead. Uh, no, I'll just, I think one thing I would point out is, you know, we look at the slopes and you look at this area right here, which looks like uh, we're making it quite a bit steeper. Really, good. these are one-foot contours, just space within existing two-footers. So really, spacing here and the slope is, is essentially the same in this area. So that might be a little misleading when you look at that. 
Yeah, I think, as Andrew said, I think one of the primary reasons that this project came about is because it's obviously uh, there's some serious drainage issues and uh, it's just too much of a mess for the kids to use uh, in the spring. Now that we've, this is like a two, six, 2016 project in our office, so I've had a chance to see it for a while, and uh, it's, you can see why in the spring, that it's really, um, really needs some help. So what we've got going on, uh, other than things Andrew mentioned, and it's correct that we, in order to accommodate the vestibule, we push this bank back a little bit. We're pretty similar here, um, and we do want to improve the, the field, which is, uh, it's really a, kind of a dust bowl, or, or mud, one or the other. Uh, depending on the season. So with this, um, we have stormwater treatment here, which is a gravel wetland treatment system intended to treat, basically treats a good portion of the fire lane and some of the walkways here, areas here. Uh, we have a bioretention area for rain garden is there currently we talked about. This, this actually is pretty small and it's, and it's modest. It treats some of the sidewalks right around that area. Uh, and then we have another rain garden, or sorry, another gravel wetland in this area. I don't know if you're familiar with the gravel wetlands. It's a, no. It's kind of a horizontal filter is the way I think about it. So it's a, it's a, it's a high performing treatment system. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of doesn't require a lot of elevation difference, which is kind of makes it kind of a go to. Uh, like a UNH data gives it a really high performance. Uh, uh, removes some phosphorus sediment. You know, it's, so for this this scenario, we're really limited on elevation at these points, at discharge points. It's a good option for us. So how, how does that work with the horizontal? Does the water flow through it on the, sort of a continuing on yes, the slope? So, or? so come into the top of, top of the system, and then it goes through perforated risers. So it goes through a perforated riser into the gravel media, which is open gravel media, and it flows horizontally through that. And then it gets picked up at, at the other end by a, a perforated pipe and then discharges. So we have the opportunity to kind of control the rate, and then the, it the, uh, you know, because it's a long flow path and it's a long flow, slow flow path, you get a lot of settling of particles and some uh, adhesion to the, to the media. Um, so it's a good management practice, uh, especially for sites like this that have some constraints. And, and where does it discharge into? Does it discharge into a stormwater drain? Or? Yeah, we're going back. And basically, the whole site right now just discharges to the street drain system a couple points here. Uh, and we're still having that. We're just doing with, with more control and treatment ahead of that. Um, in general, the site is, the drainage on the site is pretty similar, except for the fact that we're introducing treatment and, and we're also stabilizing some of these areas. Um, Andrew mentioned the retaining wall work. Uh, the existing, there's a concrete crib, kind of an, it's an interesting style. It's like uh, Lincoln Logs, but it's concrete. That's uh, our, our geotechnical engineer said it was stable, so we're trying to reuse that. We can't break the school budget any more than we have, um, but it is stable, so we're just going to clean that up. Besides, we're adding a bit of gabion wall. This is like this is I think less than four feet. Uh, gabion is a uh, wire basket it's filled with stones. Uh, this end, some gabion, and then in the dumpster area, trash area, uh, we're bringing in sheep pile wall. So this this. We have a grade differential, like 7.2 is the highest in the corner, 7.2 feet. We're moving into that bank a little bit, so we're either going to temporarily sheet pile it and then put some other retaining wall system in or do permanent sheet pile. So we're doing permanent sheet pile here, given the use and, and the location. What is a sheet pile? Steel, steel sheet pile. So it's steel sheets are kind of um, W-shaped, corrugated. It's kind of like the inside of a cardboard box, that kind of shape in there. Mm -hmm. But it's, they lock together and they, uh, they drive them down. And in this case, the sheet piles rely on the buried portion to restrain the earth above it, as opposed to like the gabions are, are just by weight. The weight of it holds it, holds it back. Is that sheet pile what you what you see at construction sites when they're digging down yeah. to, but then they're often removed after they can. Right, right. In that case, yeah. So often we do that. In this case, you know, we wouldn't necessarily prefer to use that throughout the site for the aesthetics, but it's, you know, it's, it's uh, steel and be in the, in the trash area, which is kind of a good use and it saves us digging more into the soil. Um, soils are expensive to get rid of in the urban site, and uh, so really less disturbance and, and uh, less work on that is better. Um, a clarification point on the gravel wetland. Does yeah. that sit on the surface or is it a, a structure that is beneath? The yes. ground. Right. So there's a, there's a depression, so that'll hold some of the. Yeah. You pro it's probably in here somewhere. I forgive yeah, me if I can't quite identify it. Sheet 3.1. Right. 
So there is a depression that holds the water until it filters through. And then there's a there's layering. So there's a top top is a growth media, so it's a planting media, which is kind of a really has to be kind of a sandy topsoil mix. You know, we're aiming for kind of a low phosphorus mix, but something that'll still grow plants. And then there's a, a choker course, which is a layer of stone that's fine enough to kind of keep those materials separate, keep it out of the lower material. Mm -hmm. And then beneath that is, is the uh, gravel. It's like an open graded gravel. Okay. That, that makes sense. I was yeah. picturing um, gravel rectangles around elementary school students and just how oh. irresistible that yeah. would be. Right. Well, that's one, one of the reasons that we went with, <laughs> another reason we went with the gravel wetland is. That satisfies yeah, my concern. It's, it's standing water. We don't really want standing water in this right. kind of location. So be very temporary if it comes in. Um, it was a social more than an engineering question, so yeah. thank you. If you, go, if you go to LA uh, 301, there's more of a peeling image of what it's going to be versus an engineering. No offense. Mm -hmm. I, I could be offended by that. <laughs> Nobody wants to look at the engineering plan. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. <laughs> it's the image with the parsley on it. Pretty one? Got it. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So just a go back to, I know scope stability was a big question here, but really I think the areas we're working on, with the exception possibly of the above this wall, which has some instability already, everything else is that we're, we're trying to rectify some current instability. There's a spot on the bank here where there's a little bit of slope um, washout. I think that's because of the, there's water moving underneath the existing material, so we have underdrain system going around here to kind of collect that subsurface. Yeah, there's there's photos right. in the packet in between. You're talking about yep. okay. yeah. that yeah. existing B that looks like a washout behind a basketball hoop. Right. Is that that that's what you're yeah, talking so that about? Yeah. that's an interesting one because it was a slope repair done a while back, and it's it's a layer, so it's a more porous material on top of the tight soils underneath. And I was really puzzling on that one until I got out there when it was wet, and uh, the, I think the water is going through the top running along the bottom on that top row material, top material, and it's washing out the sand from underneath, and then the grass is falling in. So uh, the intent is kind of, we have to pick that up, pick that water up with the underdrain, and then uh, kind of stabilize that area. Great. Meredith, I do have some information from the landscape architect, reflecting a couple of your answers to your, a couple of your questions. We can, I think. All right. I think it may make sense to go. Let's start with the, um, and I think, and I'll be happy or not so happy to be corrected, but I think the easier one, which is the expansion of the building footprint and the footprint waiver. Um, the current building footprint, I think the applicant has indicated something like 31,000 square feet. Um, and it's well in excess of the 3,000 square foot maximum in this district. So we're already above. Um, and you're seeking to increase by 439 feet, square feet roughly. So about 1.4% of the total building envelope you're adding. Um, so my understanding of zoning bylaws as um, the staff has helped out is that there's no limit in the waiver that the board may grant for building footprints, but we do have to follow the process. So uh, the question is, the board must make findings that um, the waiver, if authorized, shall not alter the essential character of the neighborhood or district in which the property is located, substantially or permanently impair the lawful use or development of adjacent property, reduce access to renewable energy resources, or be detrimental to the public welfare, and the proposed land development is beneficial or necessary for continued reasonable use of property. So what I'd like to take testimony on is, you know, the purpose of this vestibule extension that's being built. So currently, uh, the only handicap accessible entrance to the building is down. Uh, you want me to drive? Will you? Is down here. Uh, and currently, the elevator is over here. Next summer, hopefully in the spring, we're actually going to be installing a new elevator here. So the idea is that we provide handicap accessibility right off the sidewalk as, as quickly as possible without tearing up the historic front of the building uh, and getting it right to where the handicap accessible elevator would, elevator would be. 
Okay. And, that, and that's really the entire purpose of vestibule is for ADA accessibility? Yeah, pretty much. Um, there's some thought that it will be used, you know, as foul weather enclosure before people, but fundamentally, no, it's an handicap accessible accessibility. I was going to say, if it's, if it's a foul weather site, it, it doesn't seem all that large. <laughs> That's why I say I don't think it's going to be used as one all that much. Maybe, maybe the after school program or something of that nature. But most of the kids are picked up out on, on uh, Loomis Street anyway. So. And, and is this being, I mean, obviously, the, I can see why the school might be interested in making the site more friendly for ADA, um, for people in, with, with disabilities. Uh, but is this being driven by any type of federal or state mandate? I don't believe anyone has told us we had to do it. I think it was being good citizens. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but, and, I mean, but, but I have not heard that, that we've been okay. cited well, or forced to do it. No, it was part of the overall just making the building more accessible. Modernizing the building. Modernizing and making it more accessible. And, and the reason to put it, it w I mean, the current handicap accessible entrance that's at the back. Yeah. Um, is... Will that change? Will that still be handicap accessible? Yeah. Uh, it will, yeah. Okay. But this is just something that's going to be that much closer to the yep. um, elevator? Yep. And currently, if somebody accesses that handicapped, existing handicap entrance, um, even if the elevator was relocated, if I'm remembering correctly about Union Elementary on the first floor, they still have to go up a ramp, They'll down a, a ramp. hallway. And the spirit of ADA and... I'll, I'll leave it at that, is you would be telling a student, you have to go back by the entrance that everybody else is using to go use the other entrance. Okay. And that, because where the vestibule is going is one of the main entrances into the building? Yeah, and especially at recess. And, and with the vestibule, will students, will, will other students, it won't be simply for disabled students, it would be for all students? Correct. Most, most of the students, unless they're down, at the unless they're down here at lunch, which a lot of them are, um, are let out from lunch to go to recess mm -hmm. or to go to recess into lunch. Uh, everybody else will head out the straightest beeline they can to the playground, which is this door. So they'll largely use that entrance and exit oh, as as they absolutely. did before. Absolutely. Um, and will there be any limitation as a result of this? additional uh, vestibule as far as anything that's being done now that won't be able to be done because of this addition? No. Are you losing? I know that there's a storage barn currently where the... No, that's been moved to Union. We're actually, as part of the vestibule project, there is a small little storage area. Excuse me, moved to uh, Main Street Middle School. Okay. Um, permitted and everything. Um, uh, there is going to be a small outdoor stair storage area that a snowblower can be stored in kind of thing, but not... It's a, it's a relatively small room. And that's, that's what was stored in that barn before was a snowblower? Yeah. Yeah, that and probably some toys. And it's been cleaned out for a little while. Anybody have any other questions about the uh, vestibule? OK, great. Um, why don't we move on and we'll we'll come back to whether we need to grant uh, to, uh, the grant of the waiver the footprint maximum so it's a couple of just sort of into the weed points um, on your sh on your diagram um, C 3.0 Which, which details the sheet pile wall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What kind of height are we talking about? And first of all, maybe let's just orient everyone where this um, yeah. where the sheet pile wall is going. Is that that's what we were talking about before over by dumpsters, right? That's, that's right here. Okay. It's right in this area. And, and how high of a wall are we talking it's about? Highest is 7.2 feet, slightly less over here. Uh, it drops off. It, it is hard to read in the small prints, but on the plan, it calls out the top and bottom of the wall. So if you were looking at approval, it, it, it's no, and not that not that it's easy to find, Sorry. But, it's, but it is like it's there as a basis if you want to have it as part of the approval. Okay, so it's it's seven feet seven feet tall at yeah. its maximum. 
Yeah. And is that a uniform height throughout the wall, or does it? Uh, it's essentially seven feet across the back side, and then I think it uh, tapers down to where I can't read it on this. Can I? I can't read it. It tapers down on the side. Okay. So the next issue um, is the swing set. Um, oh, yes. Climbing net structures. Yep. How big are these? Yeah, let me. And I can give this to Meredith when we're done here. But uh, so I got this from the landscape architect. Uh, the Explorer dome climber is 13 foot four. The swings are eight foot four. And the nest, which is this structure in the back on the slope here, is uh, 11 foot four from the deck elevation, and 17 foot one from the lowest elevation so it's, that's from the lowest grade adjacent to the top of the roof um, and so the, the demolition and I've, I've seen that there's a lot of demolition that's occurred already um, but let's just be exact as to what is what has or is being demolished on this site um, before construction commences on the new structures so all the all the current play equipment has been removed, okay. other than a few miscellaneous log kind of ground things. But all the existing swing sets, jungle gyms, parallel bars, whatever you'd call them, uh, have all been removed. The city has taken them. I believe they're being stored at Hubbard for now for reuse next, in the coming years. Okay, uh, and that includes both the kindergarten, first grade playground in the back, as well as the sort of upper grade playground. Mm -hmm. off of Hubbard Street. Um, but no no part of the actual building itself is no. being no. demolished. And as you said, the storage barn uh, has been moved as well. Yep. And is that that's not returning? No. Um, so let's talk about the steep slopes. And the, if I understand correctly, and I, I'm just going to restate this to make sure that I'm understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, along the back of the building, um, right there, yes, y y are you changing any grading of the steep slopes or just simply stabilizing? No, this is just a kind of a surface repair of the uh, tanning wall. So the, the way the wall is set up, it relies on geotextile is going to hold some stone back basically we're putting that back together the, the wall is basically staying back as it is and for the board door maybe be, being restacked a little bit but grades are the same behind here uh, same thing here we're just replacing a section that's really deteriorated on this end with the gabion which is the stone filled baskets so that's not changing either on this side really the only spot where we're really making great differences slightly in here but really primarily at that Cheap out wall, we're pulling back to create some space for the trash area, kind of free up the fire lane. Um, and and that that change in the steep slope is, is strictly to enlarge the fire lane. Is that just well, wall stabilization? Just wall stabilization. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then the other areas uh, around. On the uh, the I always call it the upper playground. Um, well, e either of those. So, where's where are we changing the steep slopes? Um, the slope here is just getting pushed back. That's that's really not a critical slope. Uh, here, uh, we're it's, we're generally doing small fill, but it's, it's essentially the same. A little bit of, a little bit of reworking. I think it's uh, right in this area. It's very small. Um, here again, we're, we're pretty close to matching grades here or extending fill out. But again, it's more of a stabilization process, and including these seat walls, that's all part of kind of a way of stabilizing this and stepping things along. So um, you're, you're terracing some of that steep slope for those? It, so you're moving the amphitheater up there, right? The amphitheater is basically the function is out here. Um, no, the intent is not to make anything steeper, but it really is kind of to. We're hitting areas or working on areas that are already a little bit uh, are muddy and, and 
surface unstable. Um, and this area is being reworked a little bit. These are essentially the same slopes, and this is not the steepest part. It is pretty steep, but it's not the steepest. Um, and again, it looks looks steeper because we've got one foot contour shown next to two, so it looks like there's more going on than there is there. Okay, and uh, about how much of square foot of land are we talking about with uh, disturbing the steep slopes? Do you still have that diagram? Yeah, I think you remember the numbers. It's not, it's not completely clear in here on how much of it is 30% or greater, which is the really big issue. So this is the plus this and this. You know, I mean, technically, some of the walls technically are 30% or greater. This is that big area. Yeah, that's primarily. So this. This is actually getting a, a, a reduction. Right, but what is the gradient of slope there right now? Oh, I see what you're saying. You know what I mean? Okay. Yeah. It's disturbance of the slopes under it's, the regs. It doesn't, doesn't, doesn't say one way or the yeah, other. It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't matter what you do with it. You're doing something with it. Right. So I, I would suggest that's probably close to the 30%. I mean, yeah, it's parts of it. I mean, that, that bank is pretty steep and close to that. I don't have it. Do you have a version of the C? Sorry, we're we're looking at C point zero. Okay. Do you have a big version of this? I don't have one. And when we're talking about the part that is likely thirty degrees or thirty percent rather, um, we're looking at this part with nope. the number forty two one. No, nope. it's no that that area is actually slightly flatter. Oh, this is marked plus yeah. or minus twenty nine. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, technically, the way the, the technically the way the regs are written. Even the retaining walls, because technically they are greater than 30%, there's no exemption mm -hmm. in the regs for man-made retaining walls, which is something that's getting fixed. Um, so slope includes human-made structures and naturally occurring slopes Yeah, the, the human-made structures to hold back no. the bank, when you're taking those down and then putting up new ones, technically that still falls within the... You're not supposed to do it, which is one of the things we're working to. And reducing slope doesn't. Same thing with you're, reduction of slope. Yeah, you're you're it's quote unquote disturbance. disturbing them. Right, right. So, it's not very practical the way it's written right now. You never can see all those things until you start using them. So. Yep, and some of us weren't here when this was being when the regs were being drafted. <laughs> so. Um, this is a lot of site work and sounds like it will lead to some long-term safety improvements as well as erosion and stormwater and all of that and some fun things to play on. Um, when a big project like this is undertaken, what are the monitoring processes after completion to make sure that it takes and settles in and does everything that it's supposed to do? There are a lot of... A yep. lot going on in this area. I'm curious to know how that is monitored yeah, there over is, time. There are requirements for the, and again, this is, I mean, the hard, the hard surfaces, I mean, will be the hard surfaces, but you're thinking primarily, I think, about the landscape elements and how the grass grows in, how there is a uh, requirement uh, in the plans that uh, landscape contractors is responsible for 90-day maintenance following instructions. Plants have a one-year replacement warranty that came from the landscape architect. That's less what I'm asking about than yeah. the ongoing stability of yeah. the structures once the slope is modified. I mean, the plantings are, I know, can be part of that, mm -hmm. but making sure that the walls are sturdy and remain sturdy. I'm just very curious, um, oh, as, as yeah. a resident and a parent, um, how, how, that's, how you keep an eye on that, maybe. Well, I'm going to jump in and say the walls are going to be secure because they were designed by an engineer. Oh, good With answer. regards to the ongoing maintenance, I think that the district and the community has seen what happens when you let a property go into disrepair. And mm -hmm. it wasn't all that long ago that there was under draining put under the playground and it sort of got forgotten about. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that after the community makes this kind of investment in this playground that we will community will not be shy about letting us know when they see something that doesn't look right and we're not going to be shy about maintaining it and mm -hmm. correcting it whether um, it's grass that's getting beat up from mm -hmm. too many little kids footprints will change a pattern or whether it's a piece of soil that that's sloughing because of some sort of underpinning that wasn't correctly okay. um, yeah. 
So as far as staying up, design by an engineer is important, and I agree that physics is to be trusted when done correctly. But I guess my real question is, is, is there a stress test? Is there a way to make sure that the walls were indeed not only designed correctly, but built correctly? Um, I'm amazed that in Montpelier, we've got so many steep slopes and houses doing what they're doing. They've done it for 100 years. That's great. I'm still curious to know just how, how you ensure that it is sturdy over time. Is there an annual inspection? Um, after you've built a, a major wall like this, what do you do? I'm assuming, well, to go ahead. well, yeah, I mean, it's, the wall we build is, is again, yeah, designed by engineers and there'll be geotechnical engineers designing that wall. Um, will be oversight, some oversight during construction, periodic oversight, so it will get built for plant, and then I think the ongoing maintenance is really going to fall on, yeah. on the school department. And there'll be, a, that. there'll be a, a one-year inspection before the, yeah. the warranty period, for lack of a better term, is we will all get together, the engineers and the contractor, and we'll take another walk around, mm -hmm. um, like I say, before that one year is up to say, okay, is everything functioning the way it's supposed to? Mm -hmm. I presume that this functions the same way uh, that an engineer works, say, like with a building when you remove a retaining wall and put in like an I-beam or something, that there's calculations behind it, yes. studies yeah. of the soil. Um, and so, you know, there's some thought. And of course, you're a professional licensed engineer. I, I understand that it's yeah, designed yeah. with yeah. consideration for those things. Yeah. Um, no, but I, I think good, you get the gist point. of my question, that there's the one-year inspection. Is there the five-year inspection, the 10-year inspection, in addition to the maintenance, which we know will be important? Yeah. Yeah. And it sounds like maybe that's not a matter of practice in, in the way that I'm thinking of it right now. It's, it's good practice. Um, and absolutely, as the facilities director for the school district, something that we probably should get written down okay. and make it part of our or yearly routine with all our projects okay. all buildings. Okay. Thanks for mentioning that. It's not within our jurisdiction sure. to say and check it every five years, um, but I express it as a community member uh, looking at the whole of the project. So how much of this, and I'm looking at C.0, is driven by um, erosion control concerns? Um, I would say, I mean, probably most of it. And I don't, and of course, I didn't bring that sheet with me. The, which which one are you looking at? Well, zero, I'm looking at C point zero, 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 which has oh, the that color, yeah, which I should have grabbed. Which you're welcome to take mine if that will help. Yeah. So really, it's, it's, it's only the, the area close to a fire lane that you're pulling back to expand the fire lane for public safety purposes that are, is not dealing with erosion control and stabilization. And those are in that flat area, which is actually good fun, there are some grass on that, and vegetation. Thanks. Okay. Um, and Meredith, DPWs re reviewed the uh, proposed changes and grades and yeah. in project. Did they have any any further comments than other what your packet indicated that they seem to approve? No. This was when it comes to the slopes. They were in approval of all the work. Um, I know that for you know erosion, stormwater issues, which are all part of this package, there's going to be some continuing discussion about the kickball field, which is the square to the northeast um about how to deal with that drainage area but other than that they were good with everything else that's being proposed yeah the, the comments from from dpw were that there is an existing drainage system i just found one other piece of that just before this meeting um, so it's there it was just been buried all this time um, 
And um, you know, we the debate is whether we reuse it or not. And I think one of the considerations is having uh, metal grid drainage grates in the play area, which is kind of a knee, knee buster. Uh, so um, I think you know we had planned on kind of putting a, a kind of more of a subsurface system in, and I think we're going to stick with that. But yeah, I think so. Uh, Tom, Tom so. liked the new design of bringing yeah. it across yeah. over the top and dropping it down into those drains. And so. Awesome. And, and just so I understand, I'm going through some of the staff comments. Sheet C point 2.0, C point C 2.0. Yeah, that's is yeah. your erosion control plan. Is yeah, that? that is. And we do have approval from the state uh, for that under the uh, construction general permit. And for that matter, I'm Meredith. I don't think you had them. There's um, we have two operational stormwater permits for this site, uh, both issued and current. Um, I can give you copies, or you probably want PDFs. Whichever. You okay. can give me copies tonight, or you can mm -hmm. send me the PDFs for us to throw okay. in. Either I one have, is I fine. Have, I have them with me. All right. And then uh, there was uh, a picture, and I just, again, I'm... I'm Moving, moving forward, unless anybody had any further questions about erosion or the steep slopes. Um, the sign wall um, that you're planning on installing, where is that, or the wall with, I think, some carvings on it? That is currently has been removed from the project. Um, if it's going to be, as you <coughs> probably know, there's been a lot of cross savings that's, that's gone through this plan. But it would be on this wall, correct? That's where I think it's yes, the section. Yep. If, if there's a, a donor or a volunteer that wants to put on it, it would be in this area. I, I would just caution um, the city learned that the hard way that uh, who you put as a donor um, may not resonate well with the I community. I think we learned that, yeah. You know, with the, the granite park that was put out front and a number of different businesses put donated money for it, put their name on it, there was a public uproar, and they had to build granite facing to cover those those names out there. Um, I don't think, I, I think, like I said, I, I, yeah. I think we learned that one, and I, I think there's a thorough yeah, quote, or I don't recall who it was, but mm -hmm. we absolutely would. I don't think the version I had had donors on it. Yeah, no, it was, we didn't have. It was right. just <laughs> inspirational messages, but, yeah. you know. <laughs> Um, but so is is the wall still being built and there's just nothing on it? Correct. Okay. And that may be a later project at a later time. And Absolutely. Okay. So it's nothing that we have to review at this time or consider. All right. I'm going to move into the site plan standards. Um, and the first issue that's come up is the question of bike access. I know there's existing, there were existing bike racks. Mm -hmm. Will there be bike racks yep. incorporated? Currently, this is not the best plan for it, but this area here is going to be paved and we're going to be have bike racks there. Um, whether we bring back, currently we have, I believe there's three of them. Uh, again, that was a cost savings. We had very nice sculptural ones that were set into the concrete. For right now, we're going to keep this area paved and bring, and, and I believe that there are, there's a group that's applying for a grant from the state for, for bike racks. So but the plan. Okay. Um, and is it going to be just in that one location? Um, as it stands now, yeah, because the rest of it is grass and um, and hilly. So that's kind of the spot that kids can ride right up to. And okay. Um, let's talk about the uh, landscaping, and what are the what are the plans for plantings? Not as extensive as they were four months ago, but still quite extensive. Uh, I would say that the Do you have my set? the LA uh, LA two hundred one. That's the material. Uh, that's that's materials. That, so. that's, that's materials. Two hundred one is the materials, the hardscape. Three hundred. Oh, here we go. There we go. Yeah. Uh, the 400s, the LA 400s. Ah. 
key itself. The planting key is on uh, 402. talking about for sort of a to is a, oh here we go with the with the tree planting key on 402 um, so it's 402 yeah we have the key right yeah so. and there's quantities so on the on right. key okay so it looks like so yeah it's a series of shade trees on the bank and then with interspaced within the uh, the upper playground area, um, some perennial plantings along the edges. Um, again, I'm not I'm not a tree guy necessarily, so um, we we will freely admit that we don't have the one shrub per five linear feet for the thousand linear feet that we have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we're hoping that we can count the, the hillside and its vegetation and the trees and plants that are up there towards that um, that that number. Right relative to the function of being a playground. So, as opposed to a forest where we lose children. Um, <laughs> uh, so I'm understanding from, I'm counting 22 new trees, and then it looks as if you're keeping about 12 for a total of 34. Yep. And then... And then all the trees on the hillside. Yeah. All the trees on the hillside, as well as all the shrubs on the hillside. Mm -hmm. um, and then it looks like I'm just going from the staff report, which I think is called from your, your report, that there's 20 existing shrubs, and you plan to plant about 111 additional shrubbery. Uh, you have to go to, yeah, probably. In the I think that uh, that's counting. Is that counting the grasses and the. Um, um, I pulled that. I honestly didn't oh, no, go you know and what? count everything. I that pulled that from the application materials. 14. I didn't mean to be honest, right, I didn't recount 30, everything. 32, 32, no, that comes from the shrub key. It looks like it looks yeah. like there's a like 13 uh, right. cornice yeah. Arctic fire, 22. Um, so a couple of dogwoods, some sweet fern, witch hazel, mm -hmm. sumac, elderberry, silky willow. Looks good to me. I think um, that <laughs> grasses could be construed as shrubbery mm. as far as meeting the purpose of the landscaping to enhance the appearance of the built environment cre well create shade no I Pro provide a landscape buffer screen land uses the grasses accomplish all those things they do but there's actually definitions in the regs ah. about what there's different categories of shrubs and I woody stems about the shrub category yeah all right. sorry all right I, I I wish it would make everything <coughs> so much easier <laughs> Um, I believe we we had that discussion during the the uh, the nymph application. Um, Monty Python joke. Um, <laughs> Rob is with you. <laughs> okay, so essentially, we're looking. Do we have a total count as to if we were to go with the five per linear square feet of the? Uh, well, I say I think I calculated as close to a thousand linear feet yeah. of building. Yep. So it, it would is required 200 shrubs and 34 trees, is what's required under the regulations. What we're what is being proposed right now is 34 trees and 131 shrubs being planted, plus you factor in everything that's already on the hillsides. The hillside. So you know they yeah. they haven't gone out and counted every single one, but my my estimation is that we're at or near 200. Mm -hmm. Probably more. And there's a standard condition that we usually put for landscaping that if the plant dies, that you replace it with within a year, a reasonable amount of time. Uh, you'd have no problem with that condition. If you plant a new tree, I would plant say it. that that would certainly be the intent, but I can't speak for the school district and the taxpayers. Mm -hmm. But absolutely, I mean, the intent is that we're going to maintain this. Um, and um, 
Absolutely. We're, we're, we're going to maintain yeah. it to the best of our abilities. If you're, if you're going to put that condition, then maybe I'd suggest that you allow them to put a different species in case one doesn't right. survive for a reason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think we give a certain amount of flexibility to the applicant as to the nature of that, but there's a requirement that you maintain the shrub mm -hmm. that, you know, this oh, is particularly yeah. important that, you know, if there's a dead <coughs> boxwood, it doesn't just sit there as a dead boxwood for yeah. year after year. Yeah, absolutely. For, for the safety of the children, we're not going to allow <laughs> trees that are dead to, to lay there and rot, and we're not going to let things get overgrown. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Um, although my son is willing to use a saw. Um, <laughs> There's good reasons for that rule. Uh, okay, so let's move on, unless there's any further questions about landscaping. Uh, there is one question about the dumpster location mm -hmm. and any fencing that you're proposing or not proposing um, about well, the dumpster. To yeah. sh well, the, the location which is selected and the way it's being installed, it's really, it's really hidden on these sides already. Um, so uh, if, if there was a question of screening, I don't know if you're... Um, what you feel about that? But. I would, I would rather. Well, I'm not sure it's up to me. But uh, the idea is that the dumpsters now that are kind of sitting right out there are now going to be pushed back into the into the corner. Um, you know, unless it's a requirement, I'd rather have the custodial staff give them the direction that nothing should be leaning against a dumpster. That a dumpster should be clean, and you should rake it out around it every now and again, and it's turn, don't turn it into a dumpster, turn it into a blue box that's sitting there and it's clean around it. Um, so uh, barring an actual requirement to put a fence up there or around it, um, rarely do they, they may look good the first day, but they're not going to be as people go in there and smash it against snowbanks trying to get trash out at 2 o'clock in the morning and right. things get broken. And um, Well, it does 3205D does talk about just sorry must be fenced does talk about the idea of outdoor storage um, and the keeping any materials goods equipment unregistered vehicles or other items not for sale in an unroofed area for more than 24 hours may be allowed as accessory use in accordance with following um, and particularly outdoor storage areas shall be fenced in and screened from view from the street and surrounding properties. So um, that's at least, Meredith, that's what you're, you're suggesting would cover the, um, the dumpsters? And, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, part of it was also not being clear exactly, you know, I, I know you have the squares here as, you know, from, from owner, however it is. In that spot, can those be seen from the road easily from there? Because I'm not sure exactly what we've got for the hillside there. Well, I mean, you, are they effectively already screened? Well, they're mostly screened. If you drew a line from dumpsters, very little of it, a very small area where you can see it from on the road. But well, it's not to say none, but. It's just that it's fenced in and screened. Yeah. That's where mm -hmm. I run into the problem right. with the okay. 3205. But, you know, it's not clear from here if the fencing is to act solely as the screening mm -hmm. or if it's fenced in to, you know, keep people out of it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, why doesn't it just say screened? Well, let me ask this question. Currently, you have like a big blue dumpster. Sure. Recycling, sure. recycling and, a, and a trash. Okay. And then there are the compost totes. Are those still there? Um, well, I just started the district on July 1st, so I'm not a hunter. And my son has been out of the school for a few years, so I don't recall where the, the totes are. I suspect they're... I just, I, I recall uh, having dropped my daughter off for years and throwing my banana peels away, that the compost was located <laughs> on the corner of the building closest to School Street, right there. They were, there were some oh, compost. Yeah, yeah. there was a couple of they, they had yeah. been there. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know and have those, now. those been moved effectively? Because I, in, in some I, case, I, I wanted right to find now, the universe. Yeah. So, so right now the compost totes are going, going closer to the cafeteria, which makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're really just talking about the two big blue dumpsters. Yeah. 
which currently sit right about here, and we're going to tuck them back here. Okay. So they're really tucked back into a corner. Right. Right. Um, That's within the sheep pile, so they're kind of tucked into the hillside, and then the, the sheep pile is above that, and the hillside's above it, so they are screened pretty well on all sides, except possibly coming down uh, the street right there, where Angie's pointing out. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and, and let me ask, is there going to be any type of screening uh, trees or such planted? Or I mean, there's existing trees in that, that side yard, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. So, through here. Yeah. Right. so it's not as if there's a straight visual shot. And what you're suggesting is it's even tucked in, because it is visually yeah. apparent. And it's, you know, it's, it's I think one of the issues of the fencing and screening, as I understood it, was to give this, these kind of outdoor things a place, mm -hmm. which is so that there is a dumpster area as opposed to a general dumpster area mm -hmm. that gets moved around. You know, and I think I've seen those dumpsters move around quite a bit. Um, and so what you're suggesting is they will have a home, a tucked in corner and nook there. Um, and it will be screened from the street by the trees and by the side of the hill. Yeah. yeah. They, they have a home now, right? Well, they have a movable home. They, they kind of have a pad, right? They're, yeah. they're just sort of... And it's going to be the same thing, but moved backwards. But tucked back in behind behind, tucked back now into a corner that we're creating that's seven feet tall on the back side of them. That is more defined than what's currently there? Yeah. Okay. Um, the language of the zoning ordinance that it must be fenced in and screened from, view, from, view, from the street sounds like a fence requirement to me. I'm sorry to say, uh, but the plain, the plain reading of it is sounding that way. I mention that in part because I'm having a hard time visualizing the tucking of dumpsters and whether and how that will be effective but if yeah I have an, a, a question to that end if there is there a practical way to have fencing um, without making it difficult to get in and out because I think I think there's also that sort of test, rational test, right? Can it function where it is um, and have some fencing from that, that road? I would, I would say that, and Paul, correct me if I'm wrong, if we were required to put a fence, a functional fence around there, I think we'd have to push that retaining wall back. This area would have to go back this way and over this way to get, afford us a little bit of maneuvering space for the dumpsters themselves. And we need to keep this area clear for, for the fire lane. So we may, if that was a requirement, we would end up having to push this sort of nook further into the hillside, taking that seven foot wall to making it yeah. you know, 10 feet wall. I mean, it's pretty steep back there. So okay. um, it's not a, I mean, it's certainly technically doable but then we're really creating a nook in the hillside for these. Um, Which is, yeah, I could see that being problematic. And that retaining wall, remind me, um, it's you're, what you're doing is bolstering something that's already there, and so you'd be constructing yeah. something this new. This area? No. No, there's I actually see. no retaining yeah. wall oh, right Oh, I see. Here. So you're that's putting in that. That's how we're creating that nook right. is so just just by pushing things yeah, back Yeah, so the point already. of this was to get the dumpsters kind of out of the, out of the view, basically, and, and tuck them in the corner, which is partial screening. Um, I think Andrew's right. If we push back further, um, we're start building a taller, taller wall. And also, I think then we start getting a little tighter on movements to get the get the uh, trash truck in there. So as we're kind of just we're able, he's able to he can sweep in there right now with the way it is. As you pull that back further, it gets a little more awkward. Yeah, because he's he needs to. They, when they do this, I suspect they're going to have to kind of get in there and. A little bit jostle it around a little bit for there. Mm -hmm. Is there are, are there fire lane considerations in that corridor? Absolutely. Yeah. So you have a limitation as to far how far out that can come. Right. And I'm, I'm guessing, Paul, that that's pretty much the minimum right there. Yeah. The uh, the direction from the the fire chief and the assistant fire chief was basically don't make it any worse. And, and, uh, which we've actually made it slightly better on 
I think we're at 16. That's where the, the, the if you put the fence in, I think you, you'd be you'd be really kind of tightly constraining that. Whereas there's a little flexibility moving the dumpsters around and that within that rectangle we've shown. And, and a practical, <coughs> and I'll speak freely here, a practical sense of that is that is a tight corner. And when we start plowing in there, and no matter what we put in there, it's going to get damaged. And as I say, I, I, for me, I'd rather push the custodial staff to have a nice, clean dumpster area. That, yeah, the only place that you can see the, the dumpster is, is it from the, the, the northern part from the road or can you also see it from uh, from uh, from the Hubbard Street as well? From, the, from, from up here on Hubbard? Yeah. Uh, no, I don't think. I don't think yeah, I don't, maybe from being up on the elevation when looking with down the, on with it? The, with the amount of trees in there, I don't think you'd okay. see it. Yeah, no, I don't think you'd see it here. You wouldn't see it coming on School yeah, Street, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right, Street, that neighbor wouldn't see it. You wouldn't see it, it there. No. You turn heading this way. Yeah, coming down this way, once you get past these trees and the bioretention area, are you going to catch a glimpse of it? Absolutely. Okay, so for the, just like that port, that portion while you're driving by would be the, the only time that you really would, would, would be able to I mean, see I, the dumpsters. Okay. And, it, and again, it would be a big improvement over where they are now. Right, yeah, right now, they kind of sit almost facing up like that, and now they're going to be. So if, if we read it as it doesn't have to be fence, and it was a desire to do screening, I mean, I, I suppose you could put a couple of shrubs in here, which you kind of break that line off. Maybe that at least you get a little advantage out of that. I don't know if that's tolerable. I think I'd rather see shrubs if it was a choice. But yeah, fence is. Yeah. And you're putting shrubs in the gravel wetland anyway, right? There are some, yeah, there are plants in that and shrubs around it. And, uh, Any other questions about our dumpsters? Um, I wanted to go over a couple of other things. Uh, what about the lighting for this project? Is there any proposed lighting? Currently, there is not. We're gonna we're gonna work with what is existing. We are putting conduit in. There are five, I believe, five proposed lamp posts. Um, for cost saving measures, they've been they've been eliminated. If they're put back into the project. We suspect that about probably January, we're going to be um, given a, a, a sort of a go no go on a lot of items. Some of the play equipment in the inner courtyard, lighting, changing maybe some of the uh, the fire lane that's along the um, east, change it back to concrete. That'll all be stuff that contractor I believe will be telling us probably and say somewhere around the new year we'll be saying okay you got any extra money and where do you want to spend it at that point if those if those features come back in we'll, we'll bring it in share with Meredith and she can tell us what we need to do next after that okay. um, yeah. go ahead I mean if, if we do it it would be a full cutoff kind of fixture it won't be big globes right but this time you're not proposing any other proposing any new lighting Okay. Uh, what's the timeline on this project? <laughs> we talked about that a lot the last several months. <laughs> yeah. uh, construction, yeah. given your blessing, uh, we've talked to Chris Lumber. He's okay with to start on the vestibule. Uh, we are our site contractor is meeting with our contractor for the vestibule to start laying out how we site layout with regards to continuing to have access to the kitchen and all that. They're ready to go uh, to start the vestibule next week. ECI, our site contractor, is hoping to take advantage of the Columbus Day long weekend when the kids aren't on campus for four days to actually start doing some of the heavy lifting, especially close to the building. Uh, and um, I think the idea is that they want to get most of the heavy lifting done before um, the ground freezes, such that when they come back in the spring, it's more a matter of uh, for lack of a better term, finishes, sidewalks, roads, plantings. Um, and the only deadline at this point that I personally care about is opening day of school next spring or next fall. Um, we're going to keep it closed all the way through, let the, let the plants and grasses take hold. 
and uh, what is that? August 29th or whatever it is. Okay. Um, and so part of the part of your timeline is definitely affected by how soon or not soon this approval comes out. Um, yeah. Is that really for the vestibule or would the site plan as well? I mean, I think we'd all like to know that we're comfortable moving forward with the entire project. Um, I think this is our last hurdle. Well, that's, <laughs> that's actually the question I, I wanted to ask. I'm glad you provide the answer to it, which is that this is, is this the last hurdle or are there other approvals that I don't believe so. I mean, we've got our stormwater. Chris has okayed the vestibule. Um, this is it. I've asked that question several times to everybody. Um, but this is, as I understand it, this is the last one. I think we do, when we do connect with the uh, stormwater, we have to meet with Tom, and I think there's another approval there, but I think that's nitty gritty stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does anyone have any other questions? All right. Um, well, actually, I've been curious. Are you taking into account all of the sledding down the hill? Sledding. Because that's all I could think about with the slope <laughs> is that, you know, all the, yeah, I remember the kids on trays, I think. I can only imagine what damage that does. I that don't was, know. That, well, that was a consideration. Not oh, okay. Involved, <laughs> but the, the sledding on... That's, there's expectation that that would still occur here. Um, I've been talked out of doing a, a stone line collection swell here. <laughs> yes, Mark. Uh, for that reason, Good. for the, I guess in case your lunch tray disappeared. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Anything further? What's the pleasure of the board? Do you want to take it into deliver of session, or do you wish to make a motion now? Into del deliberative. Uh, okay, uh, and close the evidence. And close the evidence. Yes. Okay. So Mo motion by Tom to close the evidence and move this into deliberative session. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Kate. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor of closing the evidence and moving into deliberative session, please raise your right hand. Thank you all very much. Thank for you. Your yes. Very Thank thorough you. presentation. So if you need anything, let us know. Stormwater permits that weren't in the application packet? Yeah, no. Okay. I think since I've alluded to those, I'm assuming that still count as new evidence. No. no. That, yeah, two operational permits here, and then this is the landscape architects. Okay, um, awesome. That that you read. Thank you Appreciate so it. much. Perfect. Thank you for your help okay. on guiding us through this process. <laughs> Thank you for getting us what we asked for. Last item tonight. You are. So, um, Still well, other business, though. Do. Uh, so let me just make that announcement, and then uh, I'll take a motion to adjourn into deliberative session. Um, the only other business is that our next regular meeting is Monday, September seventeenth, two thousand eighteen. Anybody have any other new business they wish to raise? Otherwise, I'll take a motion to adjourn into a deliberative session. So moved. Motion by Kevin. Second. I'll second it. Second by Deb. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please raise your right hand. We are adjourned.